on the most basic level, what is the most important thing? What is the most valuable thing that Coursera is bringing? Why does it matter? Well, the, I think the most important thing it's bringing is, is access, just reach. You think about what, um, you know, you think about what is the mission of our great universities. By the way, for people who don't know, Coursera is a platform that offers courses from 120 of the world's top 200 universities and in multiple languages, multiple countries, about half are US universities and half the rest of the world. Um, the, so think about the, the mission of these great universities is to advance knowledge through research and to disseminate it through teaching and publication. Well, we just, you know, most, most of the publication dissemination is to a limited audience of professionals in your field. The teaching, particularly at a place like Yale, is offered to a handful of students. I mean, there are many people at Yale teach three or four small classes a year and maybe only teach 100 students a year. Others may teach two or 300. One Coursera course offered online reaches more students than a typical professor at a research university teaches in a career. Bob Schiller, my neighbor in New Haven, Nobel laureate, um, you know, estimated that he's taught about 6,000 students in his 32-year career at Yale. He had 250,000 people sign up for his class and over 20,000 finish um, that, that class and another maybe 10 audit the class, you know, take all the assignments. So it's, a, it's, it's really a scale play and it's everybody, people are all over the world taking these courses. So what is, let's talk a little bit about the completion rates. Because that's been one of the concerns that yeah. when you, you just alluded to them, right? 250,000 signed up, 20,000 finished. Yeah. When you look at the completion rates, they're often single digits, they're quite low. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess the two questions are, should we be okay with that? And um, even if in the general sense, you're not aspiring to 75 percentage, 75 percent completion rates, it, are there ways to do better and are you trying to do that? Um, we're, constantly, we're constantly trying to do better. I mean, that's one of the exciting things about being in a Silicon Valley company. I mean, the, the, the ethos is try experiments, test, iterate, get, make, make the product better, make the, course, make the courses more engaging, make the way the thing is built more likely to retain people. But that said, you know, we're offering this stuff for free. You come to the website, you sign up and, and, uh, for a course, and you go and look at it. You know, you, you may be, in, in fact, in the older system, you could sign up months in advance, and the course didn't start till a certain day, and actually a lot of people, did, you know, who were signing up didn't even start the course. Today, you can access most of the courses on demand, and that, and that improved that, that piece of leakage, but it's still the case that most people watch one video and decide, I'm not gonna take this course. Well, we don't consider that a failure. So what we, what we care about more is what happens if you've engaged and actually done a full week of the course material, do you stick with it? And that number is, that's in the 30 to 40% range, completion from that point forward. And we think that's not bad, but it should be, that's what should be 60 or 70% if, if we can do better. Give us a sense, what is the business model? So, so come, coming off the lofty ideas about, about universality and, ex, and expanding knowledge, for Coursera particularly, what is the model today and what's the long-term model? Yeah, so the, so the model today is pretty simple. You, if you want a verified certificate that you completed the course, which requires you to be your, you know, a, you know, a webcam a check to make sure that you're the person you say you are, uh, and keystroke analysis, so two ways of verifying a person's identity. I, I, you know, who knew this? It, you, people have distinctive patterns of typing, and you can tell two people apart just like you could with fingerprints. And, and so, We've, we verify your identity, and then if you pass the course, all the assignments completed with the and the and the certifier is the faculty member at the uh, you know at the at the at the institution that sponsored the course. So um, those credentials are are now starting to get sailing. So we charge average price forty nine dollars, some as high as ninety five, for uh, completing a course with a verified certificate. The key to the business model is is a virtuous circle increasingly companies are using these certificates to hire to as an alternative to a degree. So, um, you know, Google announced, for example, that here are 10 courses in, uh, in IT, not all were Coursera, some were some of the other providers, that, that, um, that we think, you know, would be relevant in a job application. And increasingly, we'll, I think that'll grow. I mean, right now, um, there are many, uh, uh, many people are citing their Coursera courses on their LinkedIn profile. We're actually the second most frequently cited uh, certificate on LinkedIn after Microsoft, which has been in the business for 30 years. What's a reasonable medium-term size goal for you all? 
however you define size, whether it's number of students, whether it's... Well, we're, we're, we have 14 million registered learners today. Um, there are 450 million college graduates in the world. There are 350 million people on LinkedIn. We ought to have them all. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> The, I, I love the finger recognition. I mean, it, I, it would yeah. make me worried, though, that if I broke a finger or something, you might think I was a fraud because my pattern changed. You would, you, would th you would think of something like that. <laughs> um, so something that Walter Isaacson and I were talking about the other day is this question of whether colleges that are now quite universal will continue to be so, right? In, in the old days, if you wanted to go to a college, that college really wanted to offer a broad variety of things to attract students. The internet has changed that. And so it seems to me that means we could be headed for a period in which a lot of colleges will get out of the business of doing certain things, right? Maybe one college will decide, you know what, we're not going to teach uh, architecture. Um, we are instead going to really, really focus on French literature. And then you have uh, essentially, the, you, can, you can still take architecture, but you have to do it by right. video. Right. Is, that, is, that, is that suspicion right on my part? And um, are you all playing a role with that? Yeah, well, yes, we are in a certain way, but uh, uh, potentially. But, but I think... Um, I think the tendency, the, I, I'm not sure what will happen is universities will specialize in what they offer. They may still try to be, the, the ones we're dealing with, which are the Yale and Stanford and Princeton and Penn and you know, University of London, and, um, uh, are going to still aspire to covering the map of human knowledge. But there already are ways to economize on resources um, through the use of online materials. Now, not through the open courses that we offer, but for example, Yale, Cornell, and Columbia are now finally realized that we've been trying to get this done for years, that you know, Yale offers like 55 or 60 foreign languages. And it, it, you know, th there's very low demand for the bottom 15 of those. And so what we've done is we've got a deal with Columbia and Cornell where we've split up the less popular language instruction. And you know, each, course, each school is offering a third of the teaching. And it's all done online. But, but in synchronous sessions that are closed to just those small number of students. So it's a different kind of experience from Coursera, which is essentially self-paced, self-directed, open courses uh, you know, that, that, that can support tens of thousands of people online at once. I'm sure there are potential downsides about that, but it strikes me that the potential for that is so much better than the status quo. It also strikes me as exactly the kind of thing that faculty might not absolutely love. <laughs> and faculty are very powerful groups in universities. You, you, you obviously spent a long time thinking about that. You had quite good relationship with the Yale faculty on the whole. How do we make sure that we retain this historic strength of intellectual freedom, and yet at a time where it seems to me higher education really needs to innovate, the tenured faculty are not putting a break on innovation that really in the long term could damage the, the American higher education system in the global marketplace. Yeah. In this country, the, I, there, you know, there will be faculty resistance to bringing in somebody else's courses, I think, it, generally speaking. On the other hand, there are plenty of individuals are now starting to experiment with that. The aforementioned Bob Schiller's course was used at the University of Nebraska last year um, where, in a kind of flipped classroom basis. That means students watch the video before class, they come into class and discuss it with the professor. So in a way, our courses become textbooks for somebody else's course. That I think in those kinds of models, it's not a replacement. It's a supplement. It's not kicking anybody out of a job. On the other hand, it's not economizing on the cost disease in higher education. Right. So, um, but I think, you know, I think we'll, over time, find a mix there. We'll find, we'll find some schools actually economizing on resources by the use of these materials. Where it's really salient right now, it, you know, we, we talk about the high sticker prices in the US, but actually the really, the much bigger crises that are, exist in higher education are in developing countries where there just aren't enough faculty to go around given the aspirations of that company, country to educate more people. So for example, India, which now has 12% of the age cohort in universities, um, wants to have 30. A, a transition which actually China has accomplished in the last 20 years from 12 to 30 uh, percent uh, in higher education institutions. China's done it at a cost, which is lots of these institutions have way too high of student to faculty ratio. 
and a lot of the faculty are not adequately trained for their positions. So this, this is where something like Coursera can come in you know, very nicely and provide courses that could be used you know, to, to teach a larger, larger scale classes um, and reserving the time of the faculty who are there to support the students in discussion. And things that like China-India example is really interesting. I mean, I know you spent, Rick spent a lot of time in China, knows a ton about it. I think people often underestimate one of the reasons why China has outpaced India. Not that India hasn't done very well, is that China's more educated than India. I mean, the China-India thing is another example of just how important education yeah, literacy, is. Literacy, China's 95% literate and, and India's in the 60s. Yeah. yeah, and that is, I mean, the same way that New England, one of the reasons New England became so wealthy in this country 300 years ago is because it was the most literate part of the United States. There's a version at the best school. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so you mentioned textbooks, which I think is an interesting analogy because right. it's one that sometimes critics of online education right. use, right? They say, we shouldn't think of these as replacements for courses. We should think of them as replacements for textbooks. And I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. Can these online courses be full courses. Is there anything that Coursera is offering that you would say, hey, you know what? I know you don't get the residential experience that you do at Stanford or at Yale or at the University of Denver, but you do get in the classroom an experience from this course that, that is actually similar in rigor to what you would yeah. get at Stanford. Well, there's no doubt many of our courses, you'd say, were, are, were identical in rigor to the counterparts uh, that are taught uh, in college. This works particularly well where assessments can be strong. So, I mean, I think it's biased towards subjects where you can do a reasonable job of assessing students' performance by machine gradable assignments. And that could, we can grade not only multiple choice tests, but mathematical expressions, short blocks of computer code, and, um, and short answer questions. Um, so, I th and, and by the way, the whole way these courses are structured is a step beyond what some of you may be familiar with, which is the last generation of open courses, which were just you know, camera capture from the back of a classroom where the professor's talking to the, to the audience that's present. That's, a, that's actually a terrible educational experience for the online learner because they're really not, there's no sense of intimacy, no sense the person's talking to them. Our courses are produced in studio. They're, they're, the, lectures, the lectures are segmented into six to eight minute modules. You get a quiz at the end of each one. If you don't understand what happens in the first eight minutes of what would have been a 50 minute lecture, you can go back and rewind and take it over again. Um, there's lots of ways in which the learning experience is very rich and actually much more conducive to learners mastering material than the, than the 50 minute lecture, which is the staple of universities. So we actually are offering something very positive and yes, uh, there will, we're going to have an experiment, I can't, it, it, not yet announced, in a, in a Latin American country this fall, where students will be taking one of our Coursera courses, large number of students, um, for, for, for credit, and it, uh, it's going to be a required course for first year students. What do we know in terms of brain science about the difference between learning on a screen? and the difference between being in the same room as someone. Are there major differences? It feels to me like there probably have to be some differences, but I also don't know what they would be. You know, I, I don't know that we, I, I haven't, I'm not familiar with, an, with neuroscience literature on this, I'm sure there is some. The kind of, um, the, the, the kind of, um, so, some of the uh, work that's been done on just testing competency and mastery there's mixed results. There have maybe been 20 studies sort of comparing the same group of, the different groups of students taking the same materials on and offline. Um, they're, they're pretty favorable to the online learning experience. They are. Yeah, it turns out what it, I mean, the, 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 the most favorable example, but probably not a fair one, is of the lowest level physics course offered at MIT. So you figure there's a little bit of selection bias. In the, who's taking that course at MIT? Because it's the lowest yeah. level. Physics. Yeah, but but online slackers. Yeah, well, but <laughs> online there aren't many slackers at MIT. <laughs> but online learners did better in that course than than uh, than the, than the, than the uh, physical. Online learners at MIT? Or no, in the out in the, the world. In the yeah, environment. out in the world. So um, that's 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 probably the most extreme example. Most of the other results are just closer call. It does seem that the well-taught hybrid class where you use online materials with a live discussion or live interaction, that that seems to be the best of all. Okay. Now, that, that said, 
there's huge variance in how well people do that, the, the, the in-person component. Because if the lectures are already given, of course, the worst thing you can do is just stand there and repeat the lectures or essentially you know, give the material over again. That's a, that doesn't work. When you bring people into class and you give them applied projects, sort of team tasks to work on, and you go around table to table and, and interact with them and help them to understand, that turns out to be of superior experience. So what classes would you recommend people check out in the, in the next several months? Well, uh, um, I'll give you two, two suggestions, two of our, of our courses that are available anytime on demand. So a lot of you are political junkies. So the, the first MOOC, by the way, we haven't used the term, but massive open online courses is sort of the genre. Uh, the first MOOC to be nominated for an Emmy is Larry uh, Sabato's course at UVA uh, on, the, on, the Kennedy, on the Kennedy legacy. So I think it's called the Kennedy half century. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's very entertaining. Um, if you want to really learn, you, but on the other hand, these are things that probably most of this audience knows. If you want to learn something you don't know that's really interesting, we have a course called Learning How to Learn, taught by a woman named Barb Oakley, who's a neuropsychologist. And, and what she's done, she, this is work that, that doesn't compare online learning and offline learning, but it really it's an introduction to how the brain works and what implications that has for how you should be a learner. It's fascinating. Huh. Uh, not to give away the punchline, but the metaphor is really cool. She starts with a metaphor that most people in this audience would understand, but nobody under the age of 25 would, of the pinball machine. Now, you know, pinball machines can have the bumpers very closely spaced, or they can be very sparsely spaced on the playing surface, right? So it turns out, of course, that the brain is, li is like this, because in one mode, the ball goes up and bounces around very tightly in a close and creates connections between um, you know, neurons that are closely packed. That's focused learning. That's the way you actually you know, focus in and memorize something or master a, a new language or something like that. Then there's this pinball machine with the sparse, dispersed um, uh, bumpers. That takes a long time. So the thing bounces all over the place. They don't just stay in a tight area. That's the brain in its diffuse or resting mode. And you all know this. You all know you can sit down and study intensely, but it helps to get up and walk around sometime and take a break. And actually, you learn better by alternating those modes than by sticking to one. Don't focus for three hours. Focus in 30-minute segments. The thing I always find remarkable <laughs> it's a really cool course. is when you wake up and you've solved a problem that you couldn't solve yeah. while thinking about it for that, five that's, hours. That's, that she gives all the evidence and story yeah. about that. Yeah. Yes. Am I right? Barry Nailbuff is also teaching a Coursera course? Um, yes. He's got one. It'll be out this fall. So a negotiation. So That'll I, be great. I will put a pitch in for this class. I mentioned it in the math track, if any of you were there. Barry Nailbuff is a game theorist and um, told me this wonderful story that he was on a plane and he was sitting next to someone who had open, a, I think it was a GMAT, but it doesn't matter. It was a standardized test prep book. And it was in between pages in such a way that Barry could see the answers to a question but couldn't see the question, right? So he could see at the top of one page A, B, C, D, E. The question was on the prior page. Right. And Barry looked at the five answers and he thought, I know the answer to that question. He couldn't see the question, but he knew the answer. He thought the answer was obvious from the game theory of standardized tests, right? right. right? That there was one answer that it was sort of yes, clear the other example. answers yeah. were trying to trick you into avoiding. And so one of the things that he's going to do in this, in this class, he has a whole lecture on the game theory of how to take standardized tests yeah. and how often you can eliminate answers even without ever looking at the question. When this course, when this course finally hits the, the, the screen, it's really one of, I've seen snippets of it. And he, to play out roles in negotiations, he uses actors from the Yale Drama School. And, it's, and then he, they make a move, and then he comments on it, and then you go to the next move. It's really fascinating. Yeah, 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 yeah. and I didn't connect yeah. in negotiation. The connection there is in negotiation, what you always want to do is put yourself in the mind of the other person, right? right? And so when you're taking the test, you want to put yourself in the mind of the person Asking who wrote the, the test. Exactly. So I asked before about business model. Obviously, there's this enormous pot of money sitting out there. It's <laughs> our money, the American taxpayer's money, <laughs> from, through federal financial aid. Um, uh, it seems like some of the valuations in this sector um, may be based on the idea that companies are eventually going to get that kind of money. Um, there's a downside with that money, which is uh, you become uh, much more connected to the federal government. Do you want to go after that money more than you have and try to get approval essentially to get federal financial aid 
coming to you? Not in a hurry. I mean, having spent 20 years dealing with compliance, um, <laughs> uh, 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 not, not, we're, not, we're not jumping at it. On the other hand, it could, be, it could create opportunity. So I'll give you an example. Our, our courses are very inexpensive, and we give our own financial aid. So if people write in and say, we can't, we can't you know, the $50 is beyond my you know, capacity, which happens in Bangladesh and in parts of the world, we, we basically waive the, the fee. So, so, and in the US, as long as the courses are priced at $50, there's, nobody's gonna take out a student loan for a $50 course. Now, as we go to something like this uh, model of, of granting a degree on top of the open content that we're gonna be starting with the University of Illinois, where you use the open content as a vehicle to get admitted into an online MBA program which has closed content offered at a higher price, they're gonna certainly wanna use to access financial aid for that, but, we'll, but we're gonna be doing that under their, you know, they'll administer the financial aid rather than us. Maybe down the road, I don't know. The, the Department of Education is experimenting. They've got a program called the Experimental Sites Program. They haven't actually launched anything. They've announced the program, but we've been talking to them about are there kinds of experiments you could do um, with non-degree granting institutions and, and actually qualify for, um, some of these certificate granting programs for, for, fed, for federal aid. We don't qualify quite right now. Okay. Um, so there'll be developments in this space for sure. Let's broaden out a little bit because as you said, it, it, this is, Coursera is connected to education as a whole, right? right? It's not like there's online education and there's brick and mortar education. Increasingly, they're becoming one. One of the things that strikes me about higher education is that it has arguably changed less than any other sector in our society and economy that is as important as it. If you go back to 1950 and you think about who's making the cars we drive, who's, who's publishing the newspapers and magazines we write, uh, what are the biggest Wall Street banks, some of those names from 1950 are still there, but there in every field are new names that are hugely important, and there are old names that have died. That's not the case in higher education if you go back to 1950. There are very few universities that have started since then. In fact, you could argue go back to 1850 and then the list is what? Chicago, it's, it's a short list. Yeah, Stanford and Chicago. Stanford and Chicago. Yeah. So, um, uh, so what, change my number if you want, but will that still be true in 50 years or are we at the cusp of real, are we at the cusp of more change in higher education over the next 50 years than we've had over the last 150? Well, I, that's, I, that's, a, that's a hard question. I get several perspectives on it. First of all, the, the change in other spheres, it, it's not that the gap is any wider than it ever was. When I taught industrial organization at Yale, I started my class by showing people the list of the top 10 companies in the United States in 1900. And, you know, they aren't, they're, American Sugar Refining? Where is it? Oh, right. yeah. Are there any um, left? There, yeah, there was U.S. Steel, but it wasn't a top 10 company. Okay. So, so, um, the, the, so the, the point is, the t turnover in industry because of technology changes is obviously um, very rapid and actually has been throughout the whole Industrial Revolution. Um, so, but, but universities, I mean, eight of the 10 oldest surviving institutions in the world are universities. It, it changed, you know. What are the other two? The Vatican? The Vatican and the, the Royal Catholic Church and there's some, I don't know, there's some like Scottish company, I can't remember. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so I, 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 I know it's eight out of 10. So um, the, the, the trick here is that universities, um, I mean, they do change. I mean, the, 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 the research university as we know it is a, effectively in the United States a post-World War II phenomenon. You know, the, 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 the tremendous emphasis on scientific research was, we, we had it, but at a much lower and less intense, much less important part of universities before the Second World War than it has been since. So change does occur, and I think change will occur in this area, but I don't think, you're, you're not gonna see the uh, huge amount of turnover in the top 50 institutions um, over 20 years or so. What you will see are two things. The most entrepreneurial of those top institutions, the ones that are willing to experiment more in the online space will see their reputations grow. So right now universities get ranked on the quality of their research and on, the, and on what employers and people say about the quality of their students. 
I think the quality and reach of their global impact. How many, how many lives are they transforming? How, how, you know, how much impact are they having on the rest of the world? I think that'll become one of the elements in assessing what's a great university, because I think it'll become a third leg of the university's mission, if you will, besides the traditional teaching and research. So I think when most people think of higher education, what, if not the first thing they think about is the cost. You mentioned the cost, right? right? Um, uh, I've heard some people argue, there are really interesting professors at William & Mary who have argued that actually when you look at the numbers, the cost increases in higher education are sort of no different than the cost increases in other service businesses with highly educated labor, like healthcare. Um, uh, but so one, I'd be interested if you, if you believe that, which is essentially arguing there isn't a higher education cost problem, there's a service sector cost problem. And, um, and do you think either way we're entering a period in which we are going to have cost growth that is slower than the growth we've had, which to many people feels quite onerous? Um, there's so many different things you could say about that. One, one is it's endemic in, a, in an industry that, that essentially has fixed proportions between inputs and outputs. The, the average lecture course is maybe the same size as it was before. Ratio of professor, that's a cost, to students, that's an output, is, is, uh, has not changed much over a long period of time. When you have that and you have wages rising at a level of, in line with the average productivity in the economy, clearly, and you're getting no labor productivity, zero um, growth, you know, uh, obviously you're gonna have rising relative prices. And that, that's, the, that's the cost disease identified by uh, William Baumol and Bill Bowen um, 50 years ago now. Right. Um, but, that, but they wrote that article in the context of symphony orchestras and really? chamber music groups, which is exactly the same point. Why did the cost of performance tickets go up? Because the, you're buying the same thing. The, the wages of these people is rising and yet the number of the audience they served relative to their size has not changed. So that's a fundamental problem. Obviously the scaling that we're allowing to reach more students with the same faculty could help to change that. And, and that's the story that says there will be more sharing of resources, there will be more use of these online materials as substitutes for labor costs in many, in many institutions. And that could bring down the cost. And that could bring down because the cost. Because effectively, right. when you're paying tuition, at a private university or a public university, right. you're paying for the French department regardless of whether you're taking French. Yeah. You're paying for the architecture yeah. department. In the brief interlude of time between uh, leaving Yale and 10 months later starting at Coursera, I, I, um, I, did so, I was starting to do some research <laughs> on, on this issue and discovered some very interesting things. So for example, the, the, the highest rising tuitions in the, in the United States are in the state institutions. They, they're rising at a you know, three times the rate of private institutions. And why is because of the erosion of state government right. support. And if you look, it's really interesting, if you look at long-term, 50 years of data on both research funding, which is federal, and, and, and funding for general education support, which is state, in both cases, if you look at the pattern of federal and state expenditures, what you can just see, just bright as a light, is that, is that expenditures on education and, by the way, infrastructure and uh, 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 have diminished. All the, they're, they're, it's entirely been compensated for by a rise in health care costs. So what, what, you know, health care was 20, was, was, all of entitlements were 24 percent of the federal budget. In 1963, they were 60 percent of the federal budget in 2013, 50 years later. Research support by the federal government was 10 and percent of the federal budget. In 1963, it's 3% now. And so healthcare has essentially crowded out. Healthcare is crowding out, as if we didn't know this, is crowding out discretionary expenses. So some of you may have been here sitting in that same chair last night. Larry Summers um, talked about the slowdown in healthcare costs. Right. The, which seems real and which seems yep. now to not just be about the economic cycle. It's not just about the Affordable Care Act, but it seems to be helping that. There's a way in which that could actually be very good news for education if it continues, right? Because wouldn't it free up more money potentially for, yeah, it, for these things? Yeah, it could. Although we, we, it, the increases in healthcare have slowed down. They're, they're still, I mean. The, it doesn't allow us it, to go back to where un, we were. Yeah, it's un, it, it, it I mean, the, the, something has to be done. Yeah. Yeah, more yeah. than has been done. Um, so one thing that I always wonder about is yeah. it strikes me there are all these parents out there who are trying to make decisions among universities, right? And, and kids, too. It seems to me there's virtually no information about how much people actually learn 
at universities. Right? It actually, no one knows whether people learn more at Harvard than at UMass. Everyone sort of assumes people learn more at Harvard. Um, does the rise of online education mean that it is plausible that we will learn more about that? Yeah, or yeah. even though the universities will own the data? Because it seems to me the universities, particularly the ones that are prestigious, have a big interest in not letting anyone see this data because people just assume they're doing a good job. Actually, I, I, we, our partners are very interested in um, you know, having open access to our, to, you know, to our data so they can publish results about, about learning, learning outcomes. Um, it, we, we do make it much easier to study these questions because you have, we have large data sets. You know, I was telling David earlier, you know, when I used to teach economics, I'd go through a course, I have a course of 50 people. I, I, I'd notice that people aren't getting a particular concept, so next year I'd kind of tweak my lectures, but it would take three years or so before you figured out, did I really get this one right? On, on, on Coursera, you have real-time data. Every day, the data is refre are refreshed, and you can see how your students are doing on every segment of your course in terms of their uh, quizzes, and you can see where they're falling asleep. That is, which videos do they not finish watching? Or where is the transition probability from video one to video two low? And you can go right in and, and sitting at your desktop and reshoot the video or, or change the, the question and you get, much better, you get instant feedback. Within a few weeks, you can figure out whether you know, we've made the right improvement. So that's, that's hugely helpful to improving the quality of teaching everywhere, because you can really study learning outcomes. Um, I think there'll be a real push, led by this, ex these kinds of examples, toward trying to measure competencies. Now, here's the problem. The, the higher level, the higher order competencies, which are not subject matter mastery, but critical thinking skills and writing skills and you know, self-expression, those things are going to be much harder to measure through the kind of testing that we do. And frankly, you know, I think most of the people in this room have had an experience in college where there was face-to-face -face interaction, where there were seminars where your classmates challenged you, where the professor challenged you, and where you challenged back. That's harder to replicate online. It's not impossible, but it's, it's, but it's harder, especially when you're doing it at large scale. So I think there's still a, clearly a role for face-to-face -face education uh, for, for mastering and improving on these higher order competencies. But, but for basic content mastery, this is gonna be a real winner. Last question before I let other folks ask questions. So Right there, you just alluded to some of the challenges for online learning, right? Which is there are real advantages to face-to-face, -to -face, right. small numbers. It seems to me there are also some inherent advantages to online learning, and some of them we've talked about. But another one is we have put all these things on top of the American university that have almost nothing to do with learning, right? <laughs> the best example and... The best example, <laughs> right? There are all these student activities. There are these student centers. There are sports. Right, and, and we are both sports fans. I'm sure there are many sports fans here. There's, there's no other country in the world right, that, that treats colleges as a kind of minor league sports. Um, those bring a lot of costs. Uh, they take up a lot of slots that are very valuable. Um, could you see that online education essentially has a chance to make Part of, to purify parts of higher education, to show that, you know what, you don't need 25 sports teams to do a great job teaching, and, and, therefore, um, and therefore it means that we'll start to see a retreat on some of these non-educational parts of colleges. Um, Are you mic'd? Some of the non-educational parts are, of course, very much worth preserving. I mean, the, the intense social interactions among students and, and all of that. Um, the sports front, the, one of my less successful reforms at Yale was trying to, based on my daughter's research with Bill Bowen, was, um, was an attempt to trim the number of admission slots that went to athletes. We did it for a while, and it, it didn't really impair our competitiveness uh, very dramatically uh, in sports, but it certainly got a lot of uh, coaches and alumni upset. and, and um, uh, and actually, we were on a path to making the, making the Ivy League do this uniformly, but when Larry left Harvard, I lost my strongest ally on this subject. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, was tough to, it was tough to get done. Um, will online learning, I, 
I don't think it'll, I don't think online learning per se will have a big impact on that. I think it's much more um, just the increasing scarcity of these of you know admissions the admissions ticket to the Yales and Harvards that will will continue to put pressure on you know having too many special interest groups have claim to slots. This is a this is an, a, a prediction without a huge amount of empirical evidence. I bet the sports issue may start to fade over time. I think. I think there are a lot of alums in their 30s and 40s who feel a deep connection to their school and don't particularly care about the sports aspect of it. And my guess is there will be a less alumni pushback on cutting sports in 20 well, years. Well, having just won a national hockey championship a couple of years ago. <laughs> I could know. be wrong about <laughs> that. Um, uh, please, um, uh, let's start here. Um, uh, please keep the, the questions as questions. You've got to, and wait for the mic because we're videotaping. So, so two things. Um, I was fascinated by the Michael Lewis article a week or so ago in the New York Times. I'd love if you've read it to comment on that. The one about the gift he gave to Yale after being turned out at Harvard and the, and the, the, the fictitious but very funny uh, series of meetings and discussions that that prompted at the Harvard Admissions Committee about how they could have possibly not selected somebody who was later capable of giving $150 million to their school and how they needed to completely revamp their admissions process. So I don't know if you read the article. I didn't read the article, but we'll go back and but read it. It was in the New York Times. So you, okay, yeah. so but if you haven't read it, I'd love to get your, or yeah. your view on it. But my question is, in, in an age of, I mean, we've heard talk a lot about education and how we learn and learning's important. In an age of increasing identity politics, is it really realistic that people are gonna pick schools based on what they're gonna learn as opposed to what they're gonna be identified with for the next 30 years of their life, professionally or socially? Well, I think there's still a lot of that in the at the very top of the pecking order, you know, in the in the U.S. People want, and well, and actually a lot of other countries too. People will want to go to the the schools that are considered the most competitive, and do the most for your, you know, for your future identity, if not necessarily your learning. Um, so I think that's that that's probably with us for a while. I, you know, I want to get one more point across that I we haven't covered, Please. just so people understand. Only about. 22% of our students are age 22 and below. So about 7% are high school students and about 15% are university age students. The rest are older and they're either taking it because they want to learn about the brain because they were interested in what I said earlier or you know just for personal growth and, and enrichment or they're taking these courses for career advancement. They're taking business or IT courses or data science courses because it will help them get a better job. And we've actually surveyed our learners and found it's amazing. About half of our learners look to these courses for career improvement. And of those people, most, great majority, report that they felt it gave them a significant, valuable benefit in their career. Hmm. Right here. And to be clear, my prediction about sports was, was about those schools you just referred to. Right. The, the, uh, Michael Crow from ASU was here, I don't know how many days ago. And he was talking about the partnership that he has with Starbucks uh, for online learning yep. for all of Starbucks employees. And I just wondered in terms of that kind of a business model of that kind of corporate institutional partnership, what that does to the Coursera business model or any other standalone online educational system. Well, we're, we're, we're sorry he chose the edX platform for that as opposed to Coursera, but we are, we're working with Michael right now on introducing a whole series of courses, uh, especially focused on Latin America, that uh, Latin American learners um, from ASU. So we've we've just recently got Arizona State to be a partner of ours, and he's fantastic. I mean, he's doing great work. I think on opening up access within Arizona and through this Starbucks thing, which I think is brilliant. Um, uh, you know, w we could be a vehicle for this too. So you know, with some of our university partners. If you haven't read the Atlantic. Uh, article on this partnership, you should. And, and I don't work for the Atlantic. That's a, mm. that's a. Oh, Grip, please. Hi. Um, one of the things that I think is so interesting, uh, professors at universities have never been trained on how to be teachers. And what Coursera offers is it offers teachers, or excuse me, professors to be able to look at other people's teaching yes. for the first time. Yes and increase their skill level. So I think that's an underserved, uh, or excuse me, an underexplained piece of this that is going to be so powerful for the world. I totally agree with you. And um, what we're, what, what's happening, it's, it's so amazing. In promotion and tenure reviews in universities, 
it's, it's in most places, not so much in the liberal arts colleges, but in the research universities, it's been considered, considered taboo for the committee of reviewing the candidate to actually go sit in some classes and watch the person teach. You can go to their research talks, you can read their research papers, but somehow it's bad form you know, to, to intrude on someone's teaching. This is craziness. And, and, um, uh, and now, with the fact that these people can be seen online, um, is already changing this dynamic in certain, in certain institutions. So I think you, you're, you're figuring out something really interesting. I agree with that. Hi, I'm Heather McGee, president of Demos and Morse College 2001. Um, uh, I was really glad to hear that when you left us at Yale, you uh, went and researched what was going on in the public uh, higher education systems, and I was glad to see you talk about state cuts uh, at Demos. Our researchers found that about 79% of the hike in tuition at public colleges for the past 10 years has been due to state cuts. Correct. And we've been pushing for a return, basically, to debt-free public college for all, um, which is really what helped build the middle class in this country. And one of the, and it's been getting a lot of momentum on the presidential campaign cycle and in the Senate, um, mm -hmm. one of the sort of quiet conversations that's happening as this idea of debt-free public college because of really a big reinvestment in public systems mm -hmm. of higher education, uh, is that the private schools might actually be opposed to this, might be opposed to the federal government helping states reinvest in their public systems. And I wonder if you just have any perspective on that. Boy, I think it would get tremendous support from the leading private schools. I mean, we, we all sense this. Um, I mean, I think at least if we're talking about the, let's say the 60 schools and the Association of American Universities, which are basically the top research institutions, half public, half private, I think you'd get unanimous support from those private institutions that anything we can do to, do to finance the public institutions better would be good for the country. I mean, it just, it just would be. <laughs> the, the, the statistics on, so we all focus on sticker price tuition, which isn't what really matters, except right. that it affects people's views. If you look at net tuition, which is tuition after financial aid, even across all privates, the inflation in net tuition has been remarkably low over the last decade or so. Because basically people at the top are paying more and people at the bottom are paying a little less. It's actually one of the few things Not that's become- Not in the state schools, well, no. No, no, at the state the, schools, oh, the private, yeah. at the state oh, schools, yeah. it's, it, the increase in tuition is, is yeah, horrifically you, large. I, I did, a, in this same paper, I did a calculation, Let's see if I can remember the numbers, but the, the tuition growth in state schools um, was, over the last 20 years, was 5.4% per year. And the, the net tuition growth because the financial aid cuts in those schools was 6.9% a year. So 7% so a year for 20 years, that's a quadrupling. In, uh, uh, these are all inflation adjusted numbers. These are uh, real, real dollars. Whereas in the last 20 years, the net tuition in, among private schools grew at 0.1%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kevin. I'm Kevin Carey from New America. Uh, I have a question about the connection or lack of connection between labor productivity and prices in higher education. So you talked about the cost disease um, and Bill Bowen in his recent book, Higher Education in the Digital Age actually said, um, I'm a convert now based on his research. Uh, he thinks we're now at the point where t technology um, can legitimately increase productivity in higher right, education. Right. Um, it's less clear, however, what the mechanism is for translating that into lower prices for students. If we think about the trends in um, the teacher workforce over the last uh, 30 years in higher education, it's been a decline in the number of uh, students taught by tenured professors and an increase in adjunct professors, which is itself a form of increased labor productivity. And yet that's exactly the same time period during which prices got a lot higher. And so it's, it's easy to envision how a, a college could create a less expensive class that's just as good, it's less easy to envision why they would then cut tuition based on that, that, that increased productivity. Well, state, in the state schools, I mean, after all, after all, the tuition is overseen by public regulators, effectively, and um, I think it could, I think if the state, if those schools could meet their budgets more effectively by by scaling the productivity of their faculty, I think you would see tuition breaks. I, why would the state government give them more money if they don't need to? So I think actually the, the competition for resources in the public sector will 
would actually take care of that. You would pass, you would see a pass through. Privates are a little trickier um, because you could argue right now that the elite privates, you know, are way underpricing admissions for the full payers. I mean, people would pay a quarter of a million dollars a year to send their kids to Yale if they could afford it. So, so um, you know, the, the, whether the, and since those schools give full need-based aid, so they basically price discriminate to what, to what you know, not charge people more than they can afford. You don't. Um, it, it's true there would be less pressure, I think, for those schools. Keep the microphone right here. Uh, Kevin started got a little bit at this, but I was wondering what you predict uh, online education will do for the academic job market in, say, the next 50 years. Huh, it's gonna, interesting. By the way, Kevin, I liked your book. <laughs> um, the, um, and it's available in the bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> right. Very, he has a very interesting sort of story about the evolution of American higher education and the fact it's trying to do three things at once and not that are really hard to do simultaneously. Um, the, 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 the academic job market and uh, academic labor market, uh, it, it, hard to tell, I mean, the, uh, exactly what the effects will be. I think one thing that I think isn't all that likely to happen is what was predicted in the early, you know, the first year of hype about MOOCs, that you'll end up with free agent professors, be, you know, you know sing, the best professor dominating the field, you know, the kind of internet phenomenon that is a, a, an emergent monopoly provider. I, we don't see much evidence of that so far. Um, people are picking much more on subjects than on, than on the professors and um, what, they, what they study. Um, so I, I, and, and at least the two leading platforms uh, are working, that's Coursera and edX, that are working with academics are working through the institutions, so we're not creating freelancers. Now, there will be some impact on the disparity of income within the professorate because um, most of the institutions are gonna share the revenues in some formulaic way with the faculty creators the way they now do with patent royalties. When universities own patents, they, they typically give the inventors a share, and that does, you know, that's created a bunch of, you know, multimillionaires among among uh, biomedical scientists in particular at some of our institutions, but, um, but it hasn't really fundamentally changed the dynamics of the labor market, and I, I kind of doubt that this will as well. I, I, I don't see a lot happening. The other side of, the other issue, of course, is not, is not the, the creators of the content, it's what happens to the schools that are gonna be largely consumers of the high quality content, and will the demand for full-time faculty positions continue to, to erode there? And I think that could well be, you know, and, it, and, it, and uh, it will be part and parcel of this productivity improvement that we would be seeing system-wide. You know, we're not, we're not pushing that. I mean, our, our, we, we want to, you know, first of all, as I said, 78% of our learners are post-college age, and um, uh, transformation of the, co of the university sector is not sort of top of our list of what's important. Um, but, there, you know, longer term, there could be impact. We have time for one more in the back there. Uh, Mary Marcy, I'm the president of Dominican University in California, and I have a couple of quick questions that I think are related. You talked earlier about um, retention rates, and I wonder if you could dig a little bit deeper in some of the things that we've certainly read in the higher ed press that says it differentiated not only by um, age, but also that there was a lot of concern about differentiation by social class, by um, race and ethnicity, because I know access is a big goal um, uh, for, for part of the Coursera enterprise. Related pieces, uh, we actually were one of your learning hubs uh, in the United States and had, right. and it's related because we had great retention. The people who had the, you know, kind of focus yes. and energy to come to a learning hub along with taking the course uh, did really well. So I'm wondering if you're thinking about expanding that learning hub notion and if you could talk a little bit about it here because I thought it was pretty powerful. Thank you, that, th thanks very much. That, that's. Um, it is true, we've, we've got a number of institutions that are cor essentially Coursera learning hubs, which means groups of students take the courses together. They gather physically, maybe once a week or possibly more often, to discuss the material with, a, with some facilitator, who might be a professor, but might be, in the case of the State Department, we, we actually have about 60 of these in State Department, in embassies around the world, um, where you know, somebody on the educational attache staff 
basically as a discussion facilitator. Or actually, in a few countries, we're using Fulbright scholars as volunteers to come in and, and, and uh, run these, uh, these learning hubs. Um, and the SLIM Foundation in Mexico and the Lehman Foundation in Brazil are both um, uh, creating learning hubs, network of learning hubs for us in those countries. So that is, you're right, it, it definitely helps with retention um, and with completion. And um, you know, just another piece of evidence that a kind of hybrid model, get the high quality content at scale and then you know, get some hands-on interaction makes it even better. That's true. Um, I'm sorry, you had something at the beginning that you were asking. Access completion. Ac oh. Oh, social class, yes, thank you. So I'm not at liberty to give details about this learner survey because it's under review for publication in an academic journal, but, the, but just a, um, but a teaser is this. We found that in terms of people's, in terms of the people reporting that they got career benefits, that, that, that was differentially higher in low-income groups than in high-income groups and differentially higher in developing countries than in OECD countries. So that's all, that was the good news. So in honor of the math track that the Institute's had this week that Kitty Boone has put together, at the end of every session I've given people a little math puzzle. Oh. And there's actually a connection here because it comes from Barry Nailbuff, who we mentioned before. Okay. So this one is an online one. If you go to the New York Times website now or the Upshots website, you'll find a 60 second puzzle um, courtesy of Barry Nailbuff, which if you like can then be a teaser to take Barry Nailbuff's Coursera course. Okay, Paul. great. So, great. Thank you for joining us. I thought us. you were going to make me answer it. No, no, no. <laughs> thank you all for coming out. Really wonderful Thanks. questions, too. Thank you all.